let's talk about muscle contraction and specifically I want to talk about isokinetics. Okay, so to get to isokinetics, let me go through the uh, general words that we use to talk about muscle contraction. And you've learned these in other classes. Uh, I, I do have to uh, state that sometimes, um, depending on which class you learn these terms in, we use a little different terminology. At the end of the day, we mean the same thing, uh, but I'm gonna go through a little bit more about the uh, mechanics of these, uh, of these words. So the first one is a concentric muscle contraction. And this is where the muscle is generating a force and that muscle is shortening, okay? Muscle generates force and muscle shortens. Now, I should also just on a sidebar, talk about two terms in vivo and in vitro, all right? In vivo, in essence, means in the body, all right? So when we're, when we're talking about um, defining something in vivo, it's a V, or we're talking about uh, testing a muscle in vivo, we're talking about testing the muscle in the body. And when we, when we do that in the body, we're really talking about the muscle tendon unit. Uh, where the muscle obviously is the contractile component uh, that we're interested in, but the tendon connects the muscle to the bone. Right? And so uh, here I said where the muscle shortens, um, in vivo, we might say the muscle tendon unit shortens. Right? And that's important to distinguish because the muscle is the active uh, component here that we're, we're interested in. Uh, well, at, at least at this stage, we're also interested in how the tendon uh, behaves uh, during contraction. But you can have stretching of the tendon and no change in length in the actual contractile component of the muscle. All right? So this is where it gets a little confusing. This is why sometimes we use different terms based upon what type of class we're in or what or we're talking about. But in essence, a contraction muscle, uh, excuse me, a concentric muscle contraction is where the muscle generates a force and the muscle shortens. If we're talking in vivo, I would uh, emphasize it's the muscle tendon unit that shortens uh, most of the time. If we're talking in vitro, this means in the test tube. So this is out of the body. So we take the muscle out of the body. So in the test tube. So we're, we're looking at what's happening under the microscope, what's happening when we take the muscle out of the body. Obviously we don't do that in human research, but we would do that in animal research. I don't do that work, but others do, where they take a muscle and dissect it out of an animal, a frog or a mouse or something. And then they study the characteristics of that muscle in vitro or in the test tube or on uh, a Petri dish or something like that, where you're looking at the muscle independent of the brain at this point. And both of these uh, perspectives are really important to understand how muscle operates and how muscle functions and the performance of muscle. But it is important to recognize when we start defining these terms to know, wait, are we talking about in vivo? Or are we talking about in vitro? And, uh, and how are those similar and how are they different, all right? In vitro, this definition is always true. Muscle generates force and muscle shortens when you're looking especially at just a contractile component of the muscle tendon unit. In vivo, we may use this term or we may say the muscle tendon unit shortens, but knowing that the tendon can stretch, and therefore the muscle itself may not actually go, be going through a concentric contraction. Okay, so that's the first muscle contraction. And we're gonna to get to isokinetics, okay? That's where we're headed. The second uh, term is eccentric muscle contraction. 
And again, I know you've had these terms in other classes, so this is a bit of review, but this is where the muscle generates force. But lengthens. And, and I should say, muscle generates force to try to shorten. Okay. But it gets longer. Okay. So the muscle is trying to shorten, but it's actually getting longer. Okay. And again, we have in vivo and in vitro uh, uh, types of, uh, of tests here. Uh, muscle force. Uh, but is but lengthens. Okay, so this is where we're trying to go through elbow flexion. For example, we're trying to do that, but we're going through extension. So the bicep brachii are contracting while we're going through extension, and that uh, type of contraction we would refer to as an eccentric muscle contraction. Muscles getting longer when it's trying to shorten. This actually introduces some neat uh, discussion in how the muscle actually does shorten and uh, starts to get more into the details of how cross bridges are formed within the sarcomere. Um, and uh, this is a, a really interesting area in terms of whether or not those cross bridges when formed are rigid and the eccentric contraction is a, is a physical breaking of the cross bridges or if the cross bridges are much more loosely formed and there is a sliding of the uh, cross bridges as the muscle gets longer. Remember, the muscle is trying to shorten. The sarcomer is trying to shorten. That's all it can do. Okay, but here we have uh, the actual uh, act of the muscle getting longer when it's trying to contract. Okay, the next one is isometric. Muscle, generate for, muscle generates force. Gener, ah, generate, sorry, bad spelling, but generates force, but no change in length. ISO, same metric, a measure of distance. So no change in length, same length, even though the muscle is trying to generate uh, force. Now, again, this is um, something when we look at in vitro versus in vitro, but in, excuse me, in vitro versus in vivo, in the body, this would be the muscle tendon unit may not be changing length. In the test tube in vitro, uh, we would definitely uh, have the, the muscle contractile unit identified as not changing length for an isometric contraction. The trick is in the uh, body, the tendon, uh, the elastic tissue can have a little bit of slack, a little bit of slop in the system. So you could actually have a shortening of the muscle, even though there's no change in visible length of the muscle tendon unit. So again, this is where we just need to be careful when we're talking about isometric contractions, there may actually be a component of concentric contraction even though there's no ch physical change in length or no change in angle of a, um, of, of a joint. Right? So we just need to pay attention to that. And, and the, the subtle details here uh, ultimately can be important. Okay, another term that is often used in the same uh, area when we're talking about a muscle contraction is isotonic. Okay, so now we have same tonic and tension, uh, tonic means tension. So same, force applied to the muscle. Okay, so now this gets a little confusing because of the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the isokinetic word next. What people generally mean by isotonic is that the same external force is being applied uh, to the muscle, whether that be in vitro or in vivo. The easiest way to understand this or apply it is this is free weights. So you're holding a 25 pound dumbbell and that tension provide, provided by the dumbbell is 25 pounds. And that 25 pounds is not going to change during the course of muscle contraction. 
What gets a little confusing is uh, some texts uh, refer to the muscle being under the same tension. And th that gets a little confusing with the next term, isokinetic, which we'll talk about uh, in a second. Uh, but I, uh, I use and others use isotonic to, to in essence mean exercise where we're dealing with free weights, okay? The, the weight is constant. And that's the same tension, 25 pounds. But you know, if you took, especially if you take an undergrad biomechanics with me, or I'm sure others have done this as well, um, when you go through a range of motion, the amount of force a muscle generates will change if you're holding the same weight. So if you're holding 25 pounds, that does not mean you're exerting 25 pounds of force at the muscle. And this is where things start to diverge in terms of how this term is ultimately used in different uh, areas. But for our context and, and our perspective, isotonic, same force applied to the muscle, same tension. In this case, that same force means the external force. So this would be free weights or the uh, 25 pound. Okay, so now we're on to our, our term that we're really working towards, and that's isokinetics. Here we have same, and uh, iso same. Kinetics is the branch of mechanics that we, we use this term to represent the branch of mechanics where we study the forces that cause movement. Kinetics can also be interpreted as, as motion. Uh, we have kinetic art, which is very uh, movement uh, type of art. But uh, kinetics can, can be referred to as movement because forces are, we're interested in forces that cause movement. Okay, so there's a link uh, with the kinetics. And so sometimes you're here, people define this as uh, same um, motion or same velocity contractions. I still stick with same forces and I'm gonna explain those same forces uh, acting on a, uh, on a limb here in, uh, in just a bit. So uh, let me write this out. So this is a muscle contraction where the muscle generates a force and the result is constant velocity, okay? Constant velocity, so I'm gonna explain this more. I also uh, like to say this is the uh, same force, okay? Same force is isokinetic acting on a limb. And this is the part I wanna uh, explain in a bit more detail. I'll keep my numbers going here. All right, so isokinetic. So now I'm going to draw a picture of, uh, of someone sitting on a uh, bench or a table or chair and doing a knee extension exercise. Okay, so here is the person's stick figure, and this is a bench, okay, of some sort. Here's the ground, and I have the quadriceps here. The quadricep wraps around the patella and inserts on the tibia, okay? I'm not gonna draw any of the other muscles. And what I'm going to do is uh, have the person try to extend at the knee. So that obviously means the muscle is going to generate a force to pull on the leg. And what I'm going to be interested in, in for my kinetic analysis is just the movement of the leg. Leg, I'll say leg and foot segment, okay? So now to do a kinetic analysis, we need to identify the forces acting on the leg or this leg foot segment. What do we have? Well, we now have, I actually use a different color marker for this. We now have the muscle force due 
due, due to the quadriceps, okay? We also have a muscle, uh, excuse me, a force due to gravity. And this force is represented as the weight of the foot leg complex, okay? Now, what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna have this person sit in a special machine where they put their ankle or the distal aspect of their, of their leg on a cuff, okay? And that cuff is uh, hooked to a machine that the person's gonna push against and that machine is going to provide a resistance. So it's like a leg extensor uh, exercise. But in this case, the machine is gonna be an electronically braked machine or it could be hydraulics, okay? Those are two common ways to do uh, isokinetics. So this is um, pushing against a machine. training device, okay? And that machine is pushing back on uh, the person. So now I have another force here. And remember our kinetic analysis, we're identifying forces acting on the system. In this case, this is our system. We've got the quadriceps force with the force due to gravity. And now I've got this other force acting on the leg. I'm gonna draw that arrow right here as best you can see that, hopefully that's an arrow. And that is the, uh, the uh, machine resistance. So I'm going to, I'll write it out, but I'll eventually just call this uh, R. Okay. So I have the quadriceps, I have gravity, and I've got resistance. Now I have other muscles acting about the knee joint because we are interested in knee extension. Okay. I'm going to write that down, knee extension. The angle of the knee is getting bigger uh, in this case, if we're, or the, if we're looking at the angle between the thigh and the leg. All right, so uh, we're looking at knee extension. And now there's also muscles um, from the hamstrings, the gastrocnemius. These muscles also cross the knee joint and would resist knee extension most of the time. And so uh, I could draw those in here. I'm not going to, all right? I'm gonna to try to uh, I'll limit this discussion just to the primary muscles that are causing knee extension. And I'm okay with that because I know a lot of the work that's been done when we do an exercise like this, the antagonists, the hamstrings and the gastroc, the antagonists are very quiet during this type of uh, exercise. They really are not generating much uh, force at all uh, to resist uh, knee extension. All right, so now I've got three forces. And what's important to recognize is what we're really looking at when we're talking about knee extension is angular motion. And we're looking at angular motion about the knee joint. Well, once we start looking at angular motion, we need to start uh, thinking about this equation, sum of torque equals I alpha, angular kinetics. forces that cause movement in the angular world. And that's a torque. So remember a torque is the tendency of a force to cause rotation. And the equation we use is T equals FD perpendicular. I have some good videos on explaining this. So make sure that you understand uh, this concept. Uh, and the units are units of Newton meters, okay? Now, uh, so I have two equations for torque, I alpha and T equals FT perpendicular. Remember I is moment of inertia. And it's a, uh, an, a measure of an object's resistance to change rotation. And that equation is I equals sum MR squared. And this equation tells us that the resistance to change angular motion is a function of how the mass is distributed about the axis of rotation. In this case, the mass is not changing uh, its distribution through this, uh, through this movement of knee extension. 
And therefore that I, that moment of inertia is going to be constant. And the units are kilogram meters squared. And then alpha is angular acceleration, which we know as rate of change of angular velocity. And the units have to be excuse me, radians per second square. They have to be. They can't, they cannot be degrees per second square. The reason for that is radians are unitless. Okay, and so they drop out in a unit analysis. So if I combine kilogram meter squared and radians per second squared, I end up with the units of Newton meters. Okay, so everything agrees uh, on both sides of that equality sign in terms of the, uh, the units here. Uh, uh, for not only here, but also up here. Kilogram meter squared per second squared is the same as Newton meters. All right, so those are our players here, okay? Those are our players. Now, what's interesting is I've already uh, mentioned isokinetics is the same motion, uh, just or con excuse me, constant velocity I used here, okay? So we're gonna underline that here. And what that means is angular velocity is constant. And therefore, that's what these three dots represent in a triangle, tri therefore, angular acceleration is zero radians per second squared. Okay, really important. So isokinetics has zero angular acceleration. This is really important. It doesn't mean zero movement. It means angular velocity is constant. Okay, same angular velocity throughout the entire motion. So now we come back to our equations here in our kinetic analysis. And we should notice right away, if we add up all the torques during isokinetics, if we add up all the torques during isokinetics, it will equal zero. We gotta add up all the torques, they were equal zero. Why? Because in isokinetics, angular acceleration is zero. So let's go, let's look at that. So right here again, sum of torques equals I alpha, and now isokinetics, we have sum of torques equals zero, and I can put Newton meters over here. Sum of torques equals zero. Now let's go back to our picture. Let's look at the torques that we have here. Well, to identify a torque, we just identify any force that will tend to cause rotation. <clears throat> In this case, we're talking about rotation about the knee angle. So what torques are, are gonna to tend to rotate the leg foot segment about the knee angle? Well, this force will, it will tend to rotate the leg in this direction, in the uh, counterclockwise direction. We've got the, a force of gravity pulling down on the leg. It tends to want to rotate the uh, leg and leg and foot in the clockwise direction. And we've got this resistance force of the machine pushing back on the leg, trying to rotate the leg back uh, as well in the clockwise direction. So we have three forces acting some distance from the axis of rotation, we have three torques. Let's put those torques into this equation. So let's see, I've got, let's do it this way. Torque due to FQ, torque due to gravity, and torque due to the machine. I'm going to call this T sub Q. I'm going to call this T sub G. And I'm going to call this T sub R because that's providing our resistance. All right. So let's look at T sub Q. How do we calculate the torque due to the quadriceps? Well, we need to know the muscle force times its moment arm. Okay. We need to know the muscle force times its moment arm. So if I just draw a quick picture here, here's the muscle force, F sub Q. We draw the straight line distance between the line of application of the force and the axis of rotation. The shortest distance that ends up being D perpendicular, the moment arm. So moment arm 
and magnitude of the force. Now, remember when we do this, we need to assign a direction to the torque because the torque is a vector. It's represented by magnitude and direction. And we, uh, I always like to start with uh, counterclockwise is a positive movement, that, that uh, positive rotation. That tends to be, you know, work most of the time. Sometimes we switch it depending on which perspective we're looking at. So using counterclockwise motion is positive. If this force were the only force acting on uh, the leg foot segment, it would tend to rotate the uh, leg foot in the counterclockwise direction. The way I do that is I start at the tip of the arrow here and I draw a circle as best as I can here around the axis of rotation to get to the tail. And that represents the rotational direction of this torque, which would be counterclockwise, which is positive. So I'm gonna add the positive sign in here for, uh, for this torque. Now we have torque due to gravity. We need to know the weight of the foot leg segment times the moment arm of that. Okay, let me draw another picture here. I'm gonna run out of room a little bit. So now I've got this force vector, which is gonna be uh, vertical relative to ground. Here's my uh, knee joint. And now um, looking at the moment arm between this force vector and this axis of rotation, we draw the line of application of the force, the shortest distance between the line of application and the force. And that's the moment arm right there. D perpendicular G. We multiply those two together and we get the torque due to the gravity, uh, force of gravity acting on the leg foot, foot segment, which, um, Will, the, will this torque be positive or negative? Well, I start at the tip of the arrow. I draw a circle around, uh, it's a kidney <laughs> and lips. And I end up back here. And so I'm going in this direction, which is clockwise, which is going to be a negative torque. All right. All right. And then my final one, my torque due to the machine, I do the same thing force due to the machine times its moment arm. I'm going to draw that picture down here just so I can get a little better. I've got that force due to the, oh, sorry. I'm using R. Force due to the resistance. And I identify that moment arm as the perpendicular distance between the line of application and the axis of rotation, and I get that uh, distance there. The direction, I start at the tip, I go around, and that's gonna go clockwise, so that is a negative torque as well. Okay, so now let's go to our equation again, but let's draw it out a little bit more. Okay, so we've got sum of torques acting about the axis. In this case, that's the knee joint equals I alpha. In this case, this all equals zero newton meters because velocity is constant and angular acceleration is zero. If I look at my uh, torques that I've identified, the ones I'm considering, I've got these three torques. I have torque due to the quadriceps plus torque due to the uh, gravity acting on the foot leg segment. And I've got torque due, let's see, Torque due to the resistance. Let me do that again. Torque due to the resistance. Torque due to the quadriceps plus torque due to the force of gravity acting on the foot leg segment and torque due to the resistance equals zero newton meters. In this case, we identified this as a negative torque and this as a negative torque. Okay. So that all agrees with this. So this is negative and this is negative. Negative, negative. All right. all right. So what do we have here? Well, I'm going to rewrite this as T sub Q equals T sub G plus T sub R. I'm just doing my algebra there. And this represents resistance torque. This 
represents muscle torque. What's really key here is they are equal. Really important. This is isokinetics. The forces causing rotation are the same as the forces resisting rotation. That's the same kinetics. Both uh, torques are, are uh, on both sides of this equality sign are uh, the same. So this is isokinetics. That is going to result in constant angular velocity and importantly, zero acceleration, angular acceleration. And that zero angular acceleration is really critical when we do isokinetic uh, testing of, uh, of muscle, especially in vivo, when we're dealing with testing uh, the strength of a muscle to cause knee extension, the example I'm doing here, it's really important that angular acceleration is zero so that when I read the data from my machine, from my computer output, I'll know uh, that that represents the, um, what the muscle's doing. And the reason why I say that is, this is, I can measure this, I can measure that too. So this, I can measure all of this. Okay, I can measure this with instruments. I can put a force transducer in the cuff of that machine that's connected to the leg. So I can put a force transducer in here, okay? Force transducer is just a device that measure for, measures forces. It's like your bathroom scale, but instead it's a little device that I put in here, connected to a computer. And when there's uh, more force from the, the leg pushing on, the transducer, there's an equal and opposite force pushing back um, from that transducer on, transducer on the leg. But to do a kinetic analysis, we only use the force acting on the object, not by the object. So the person pushes on that, um, that cuff, that cuff pushes back on the person equal and opposite force. I measure that reaction force. And then I use that reaction force to ultimately understand uh, the motion of the foot leg segment. All right, so I can measure this. And when I can measure this, I now know the torque due to the quadriceps or collectively, I would just say, these are the torques that cause knee extension. Okay, because it's not just the, the quadriceps, there's other muscles across the knee joint to cause extension as well. But I'm, I'm just using quadriceps as an obvious muscle. So I would, if I want to be more general, I would say the torque due to the extensors equals the resistance torques or any, any torque that resists extension. And in the case that we're dealing with, it'd be the uh, force due to gravity acting on the foot leg segment and then the machine resistance force. Now, remember I talked about antagonist muscles. Well, if I did want to consider antagonistic muscles like the hamstrings, I could add those in over here, okay? But I'm trying to keep it uh, somewhat simple uh, at this point. Okay, so that explains isokinetics. And there's an advantage of isokinetics in that I can now really understand the torque due to the muscle because I'm measuring the resistance torque. When I'm doing something like free weights and I have isotonic, same tension, or I'm trying to curl 25 pounds, that doesn't necessarily mean the muscle is generating uh, the same amount of, of force and same amount of torque to move that, um, that weight through uh, elbow extension or, or knee extension, whatever we're doing, all right? Uh, that, it, that becomes more complicated because in a free weight type of exercise, this angular acceleration is typically something other than zero. So I have to deal with this moment of inertia and angular acceleration component of this equation. Whereas in isokinetics, I can get rid of this component of the equation because angular acceleration is zero. So free weights become a little bit more challenging to actually uh, determine 
how strong a muscle is because you have I alpha involved. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and uh, I'm gonna add in some more isokinetic information in some uh, subsequent uh, videos. All right, thank you.